monster that is in the sea. And keep going. Uh, in that day, sing to her vineyard of red wine. I, Yah, do guard it. I water it every moment, least any hurt it. I Just so you know, garden, garden, gimel noon, literally means that which is guarded. Kinder garden. Kin, kinder is the children. Garden, we, we even get the word to guard, means that which is protected and watched over. And you'll see the, the word gun, pronounced G-A-N, is also that which is well watered. So when he says, I will guard it and water it, that's what a garden is. And he's, and he's playing off the meaning of the word, guard it and water it. And when you guard it, you keep the weeds and thorns outside of it. Which is also a picture of the tares and the wheat, right? But go ahead and finish it. Uh, where was I? Uh, at least any heard it, I guard it night and day. Wrath is not in me. Who would set thorn bushes and weeds against me in, the, in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. So he's saying a, a picture of the weeds and thorns that he will keep out of the garden. And if somebody, see this English translation, if somebody set against them weeds and thorns, well, weeds and thorns are the trouble in the garden. And if somebody says, hey, I'm going to sneak in and sow bad seeds of weeds and thorns, that's the battle, that's the conflict, that's coming near face to face. The word battle is lachem, which also means to draw close. In a game, two teams. It's like, okay, let's meet together in that stadium arena, and we'll come together, and we've got the scrimmage line, and <clears throat> it's all pictures that he's describing. They're not just words. They're pictures. And he's saying, if anybody came against me, weeds and thorns in battle, what army has come against any other army bringing with them weeds and thorns? The Scots were protected because they had these thistles, and when the Romans came in, the thistles ripped their legs apart and they couldn't keep pursuing them, so that was a hedge of protection. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about somebody coming against his garden. The battle here is about his garden. And he says, I'm going to make sure there's no hurt to you. I'm going to guard it and I'm going to water it. We are the ones in his garden. This is all about Yahweh defending his people because we are Kadosh la Yahweh. And what does that mean? He will be our champion and defender. And this is what he's going to do. So go ahead and read some more. Let's see. Uh, or let him take hold of my strength and make peace with me. Okay. Let him, who? Leviathan? Let him, the guy that's bringing the weeds and the thorns? Let who take hold of my strength? Okay. How do you take hold of Yahweh's strength? Through prayer. Through prayer. Okay, that word, my strength, is this word, mauzi. Mem, ayin, vav, zayin, yod. Muzi. And so that's where in, it sounds like the word moose, my moosey. <laughs> Where's Rocky? <laughs> How do you, where, what part do you grab a hold of? The horns of the, well... They're wild. You, you either have a choice between the neck or the horns. Well, uh, like uh, like I said, you could grab a hold of some other part. Of, here, right. this is the only way to do this study. I'm trying to show you something here. Okay. Does somebody who has a red dictionary that wants it? Rebecca, do you want to read what the word? Here's the thing. Read the word Ayan Vav Zion. Let me tell you, there was a three-letter verb root in the middle. This is a prefix, the letter M, which means place or it turns, like the word to know, it turns it into a noun, which is knowledge. So this letter mem takes a concept and makes it a noun, but it's a non-substantive noun. Knowledge is certainly a noun, but you can't put your finger on it, right? It's immaterial. Okay. That's what the letter mem does. The word garden is that which is guarded, but you stick a mem in front of it, and you get Megan, or Mogan, Mogan or Megan, and it means shield. What is a shield? A shield is the object which does the guarding. So you picture a knight with a shield. This roof shields us from the rain. 
This light shields us from the dark. That tarp shields us from the sun beating in. They're all shields. A road can shield a fire from jumping across it and burning. It's concepts. Concepts. That's when Rad was talking about the concept of the pencil versus the description. It's yellow, it has a point, it's got an eraser. Okay, so that's what the letter mem does in front of a word. This suffix at the end basically means my, but it's not necessarily meaning my, the guy who's speaking. It might mean my, referring to the word itself. The three-letter verb root, like I said, you can stick yodes and vobs in between other consonants, and it's like wild cards, adding or elaborating, but that means the root is the word ion zion. It's pronounced, or the letter equivalent of the ion is the O, and the letter equivalent is Z, and you're reading that direction, so that's like the land of Oz. The guy who wrote the Bible, the, the guy who wrote the Wizard of Oz, Frank Baum, Baum, that's a Hebrew word, I believe that's his name, Land of Oz, is the place he's talking about here. Hmm. Who would have known? The Land of, that's kind of like Mem, but instead of Oz, it's Oz. Okay, so. To take Okay, this is the word she's reading, the definition of Ayan Vav Zion. To take or seek refuge. What else does it mean? Anything else? be brought into safety? Brought into safety. Could, can you look up the word, uh, probably Sonic Dalit also. While she's looking that up, does, some, does somebody else know how to read this? Want to put your hand to it? You want to look up Ion Zion? Now she looked up I and Bob sign. And again, I'm trying to show you how to do the study. I'm trying to help you step by step walk through the doing of what we were talking about so you don't rely on me. This is your own efforts. And we're not using the concordance and we're not using the Septuagint. We're not using a library full of books. It's just simply he read a thing in English. If I showed you written in the Tanakh that that's this word, and then you look up the word in the dictionary. So, do you have I and Zion there? I think it's on a different page than the first page. Zion is the seventh letter. So if you have to know the alphabetic sequence, you have to know where I and is. It's the equivalent of our, our, our letter O. So it's the 16th letter. So it's the back half of the alphabet. Zion is number seven. So you could say, well, this is number 16, and that's number seven. And that equals, uh, what, uh, 20... Uh, Three, so what? Oh, 23, that equals 5. 2 plus 3. So what? Oh, 5 is the number of grace. That's how people do gematria. One form of it. What has this got to do with grace? Well, by his grace, he gives us refuge. Okay, there's a legitimate extension, but that's a whole other type of study. What do you got for I and Zion? I know, I and Zion, Zion. Okay, what's that? Take or seek refuge. To take or seek refuge. Hey, that's pretty much the same thing of I and Bob's I and. That's proof that you can take the second letter, duplicate it to be the third letter, or take the two letters and stick the Bob in between, and it's all the same. To take hmm. or seek refuge. What else? Anything else? Uh, so protection, salt protection. Uh, so, so refuge. Uh, he brought into safety. Protection or to be brought into safety. If somebody is out there and we suddenly get the downpour of three inches like we did the other day, to simply come in under this covering is to come into safety from the rain. If it's a hail of arrows that an enemy is shooting, step under the step into the tank and the arrows can't they'll just bounce off. Did you find Ion Zion? Here's the thing, the way the dictionary works. If you have Ion Zion Zion Back up. Drop off this letter until you only have I and Zion. Because it's a dictionary for readers of English, if you find I and Zion, the next thing you'll find is I and Zion Aleph, and then I and Zion Bet, and then I and Zion Gimel, if there is such a word. And if there isn't, it'll just keep going until you get the next real word. So you should be potentially seven letters in front of where you just read should be simply I and Zion. 
But the Zion is the seventh letter, and if you look at for I and Vav Zion, if she was reading I and Vav Zion, the very next letter is I and Zion. So it's, it's the next entry after I and Vav Zion is going to be I and Zion. You see it? Want me to show you? That's I and Dalit. That's I and Dalit. That's I and Vav, so it's after that. I and Vav Zion. That's I and Vav. I and Vav. I and Vav. I and Vav Lamed. I and Zion. Here. So you have, read those things, read that, and that. That's all I and Zion. Strong, firm, mighty. Okay, hang on. Strong, firm, and mighty. That's not even the word protection. That's not even the word for finding shelter. So here, as you're studying these words, he's now giving aspects of the place that you go to find the shelter. It's a strong place. It's a mighty. Mighty means it can overpower the adversaries coming against it. If the shield around this garden is ineffective, like up in Montana, you could put a four-foot fence. The deers will step over it. You could put an eight-foot fence. The deers will jump over it. If you want to have a protected garden in Montana, it better be ten feet tall. Maybe you'll keep the deers out. It has to be suited to the attack. What else? Uh, strong, bright. Bright? Set of color. Bright. A bright color. Like the Emerald City of Oz. Same connotations. What else? Acrid. Acrid. You know what that means? Pungent. Pungent. It's like... Uh, Strong odor. The other the other day, I had some uh, orange juice in this bottle, and I forgot that I even had it there. It was in my truck, and it was a few days later, and I thought, I don't even know if this thing is still good to drink or not. So I took, it was slightly swollen, but I, I took off the lid, and wham, and it was acidic. It wasn't just a foul stench. It, like somebody just jabbed a knife up into my sinuses, and it's like, it was a chemical toxicity. That's accurate. So you didn't drink it? Oh, sure they did. No, they, they call it kombucha, don't they? You know what yeah. <laughs> No, I didn't drink it. Uh, sharp of taste. Sharp of taste. He's, he's, he's describing different synonyms, all of this word Oz. It has to do with color, taste, smell, appearance, and the aspect of its... Strength, which is the word mighty. Go ahead, read some more. Uh, the new Hebrew is hard, grave. Hard or grave. Grave meaning serious. At the word that I wrote up here before, Kona, zealous. Yahuwah himself is zealous over this stuff. This is describing his attitude about his stuff. Go ahead, read some more. Uh, strength, might, fortress. Refuge, splendor, glory. Splendor, glory. If they would only grab the hold of my splendor and glory. Okay, somebody said, how do you seek refuge in prayer? Okay, how do you grab a hold of Yahweh's splendor and glory in prayer? How do you do that? Does anybody want to offer a suggestion? Because he said, we're quoting Yahweh here, if they would have only grabbed a hold of Mauzi, and if we could translate that to put the concept of splendor into an actual noun, grab a hold of his splendor and glory. Jeremiah, can you tell us how to do that? Prayer. Somebody suggested prayer. If you are in a state or a mind of prayer, how do you functionally... How do you do it? Tell us, instruct us. How do you grab a hold of Yahweh's splendor and glory in prayer? Through all your senses. Through all your senses. How so? Elaborate. Your eyes, your hands. Okay, you're in prayer. Your eyes are closed. Your hands are folded. How do you do that? That's part of your brain. My brain is you would, you would bow down. Start your prayer. It's not just like standing up. 
stuff and saying a few words, but for your Lucifer's Kadosh and glory, I guess you would think it all. He's saying, so, I don't know if anybody can hear on tape, so I'll reiterate. You're saying something about, you're using your physical being, whether it's your, your eyes, your senses, your mental state, your hands. Even if your hands are folded and you're laying prostrate, somehow you're doing something to envision his stature. Is that what you're saying? Yes. With, with, the, with all that's within you. Yes. And somebody else, what was your other word? Was that you? Or? Praising. Praising. <laughs> Submission. Submission. Those are your attitudes. Right. So, if he says, grab a hold of Mausi, grab a hold of my Musi, see what I'm trying to show you by doing this English play on words like I did with the word Seuss and garden, I think that the word moose, And if you wanted to make it endearing, you say, my moosey. <laughs> but I heard that this word moose came from a French word regarding that thing. I don't know French, but that's what I heard. So where'd the French get it? I bet they got it through Hebrew. Why? We said that this was like a castle, a fortress, mighty of strength, which the enemy can't prevail against. The enemy can throw stuff at it. It can try to bring weeds and thorns into the garden, but this mousi somehow will not sustain the attack. So somehow this mousi is like, picture now a turret, like a rook. In fact, a rookery. Does anybody know what a rookery is? An rook, area where birds are raised. Place where birds are raised. One term. Isn't it also like a place where monks hang out or something like that? Maybe. It's like a monastery. I think the word for rook probably would apply. Is some kind of a place of shelter. Which is why in chess, this castle piece with the guarded door is called a rook or a castle. But look, the horns of the moose kind of look like the wall of the castle. It's the same picture. So if you had one of these and you say, okay, that's some kind of a castle. If you had a Second one up here. And then you put another wall in between. Say you didn't even have doors here. And then you put the door here. You can say, boy, that's a pretty strong fortress. If anybody comes up here, they're catching it from both sides with the fence. It's kind of a statement. It's kind of like this big, hey, that's the letter het in modern Hebrew, which literally means a fence. So in Paleo-Hebrew written like that, we could study the shape of the letters as another thing. But that's a pretty powerful look. That's the, that's the look of this guy. His mouth here with the, you know, that's the door. This is the door in between the two antlers. And we're just playing with words. Okay, what else? Uh, 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 links, you're going to... Okay, you can, you, can, you can read the... Uh, what else did he say about this? Uh, I don't know how to read it. I don't yeah. either. Here. Sorry, I thought you were done with this. Goat. It's the word goat. Wait a minute, I thought we were talking about moose. Where's the goat come from? <laughs> Out of the herd. <laughs> you heard? Out of the herd. You heard? You heard that? Horns? I'm just messing with you. I got you. Okay. A goat can have horns. They don't look like a moose with horns. Not only does it mean goat, it says the Akkadian word enzu, according to some scholars. Now, here's the benefit of this dictionary. It's telling you other languages of the Middle East, of ancient times, related words, and here's what some scholars, whoever they are, says. These words derive from the base ayin, zayin, vav, azu, in the sense to be daring. To be daring. A goat is daring. 
So something about this, you have to be courageous and daring. If you see a mountain goat, there's videos of these guys. It's just amazing. They will leap 15 feet across a ravine and land on like a one inch little shelf of stone like it's nothing. They don't even care. Why? They because they no don't have fear. human minds. huh? They have no fear. They have no fear because he didn't give them a mind to fear. Why don't we jump like that? Because he gave us a mind that's afraid and then tells us, don't be afraid. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so he specifically wants us to engage a mental activity. And whether that mental activity is in prayer or not in prayer, but just having a, an attitude of contemplation, somehow to grab a hold of his mosey, we have to be daring to go to the, as it were, land of Oz, because this can mean the land or the place of I and Bob Zion, which is I and Zion. Where is the land of Oz? Okay, so Rebecca, you are going to look up the word Het Samic Dalit. Remember, Het is like this castle wall. And then we have Samic Dalit. You, you want to look up? No, you're, 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 you want to, no do, okay, I'll look up. Hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? Sorry. Sure. What I'm seeing you coming to is the strength we can exhibit is to reflect to him all of his strength. So everything that he says he his characteristics are, if we reflect those to him in prayer, we're daring and we are without fear and we are having a mindset that is the same strength that he has told us about. Okay, so when we're talking about the treasure map yesterday saying each one of these letters represents a state of mind, an attitude, a position which is his attitude and position. And as we then assimilate as our being, as our consciousness, as our frame of mind, the meaning, also the picture of each one of these letters, we become like him. Right. And therefore, we reflect back to him himself. And you could say, well, that's pretty darn narcissistic of him. Eh, stick a bad label on it if you want. Narcissism is looking at yourself and thinking that's so great. Is that what he's doing? <laughs> he designed the greatest stuff and gave it to his people and says, I want you to dress up in my stuff. There's another verse somewhere, I can't tell you where it is offhand. Literally, that's what he said. He designed a type of clothes, which are the Moedim, and he says to his wife, hey, I designed these for myself, and I think they're pretty spiffy. I would like to see you dressed up in them. And so he gives these, this clothing, this garment, this robe to his wife, and his wife goes, are you kidding me? And she looks around and she sees the neighbors wearing something else, the Assyrians and the Egyptians. And she goes, this is what Israel did. So, you know, I'd rather dress up in their clothes. So she takes the thing that he gave her, drags it through the mud and throws it in the fire and then makes laws to say anybody who dares to dress up in those robes is going to be called a criminal and thrown into jail and despised. And then dresses up in those clothes of the Egyptians and the Assyrians and thinks, Hey, this looks nicer. Then she comes to Yahweh and says, Hey, what do you think? <laughs> and he says, I think that stinks. And I don't like your attitude. I gave you what I thought was, was, was beautiful to me, and you threw it away and dressed up in the clothing of your neighbors who hate me, who are disgusted by me, and you think I'm supposed to like that? This is where we found ourselves. This is why when we say we won't do Christmas and Easter and Sunday anymore, this is why. It's not about, don't you like the food? Don't you like the lights and the colors? Don't you like the songs? It's not about that. It's about dressing up in Yahweh's garment of splendor and glory and the prestige, all of which points to His identity. So that when you dress up in the clothes of the Assyrians and the Egyptians, or any other group, I'm saying Assyrians and Egyptians because that's what the scripture says. Israel got dressed up in that garment and Yahweh 
slam the door and says, I hope it does hit you in the butt as you leave. Slam it, boom, out of here. For about 3,000 years, and this is the chance to come home. So as we are coming back to renew our vows, we want to get dressed up in the stuff he told us to get dressed up in. That's what this is about. You got the word chesed? Yes. What's it mean? A lot. <laughs> You want, to, you want to come close enough to the camera or speak loud enough that people who are watching this can appreciate what you're reading? This is the word spelled Hetzomagdalit, and the letter Het is a fence like a castle, like the Mauthi. The reason why she's going to read about Chesed is because Yahweh said if they would have only grabbed a hold of Mauthi. I'm going to give you a different translation. Then we can look at that, but we're probably going to run out of time. We can talk about it later. What I think this verse says... If they would only have grabbed a hold of Mauzi, then everything I had promised them would have happened. Would have been available to them. But they didn't. They despised my stuff. They could care less about my ordinances. And so I gave them what they wanted, which is not me. Nothingness. Vain. Lost. Bam! You're out of here until the day you decide to come back. I think that's what this verse is saying, but as you read it in English, you can't understand it. The other day when I mentioned English being garbage, and this other fellow got disturbed by that, and I had to qualify it saying in, in Oregon, every piece of garbage is recyclable and redeemable, but no longer at face value because it's lost its usefulness. That's what I'm referring to. Now, she's going to tell us that the word pesed means and I'm saying the word chesed is the embodiment of mauzi. If mauzi, like a moose, is a castle, and het is a fence, and samik is an engineered structure, and dalit is some kind of a door or a choice, that's another way to read it. And if it means refuge and to find protection and strength, okay, what is, what is all the meanings of the word chesed, if you want to just kind of read through them? Kindness, goodness, mercy, affection, lovely appearance. Keep going. To be reproached, ashamed. That's the opposite, kind of, sort of. Reviled, put to shame, insulted. To be kind, to be pious, to show himself kind. Shame and ambivalence. Okay, not only does it mean, just don't go close your book yet. Not only does Hetzonic Dalit basically mean kindness, it's referred to as tender loving kindness, but it's also shame and reproach. So what, what is it? Okay, you want to read the word for Hetzonic. So in the dictionary, she read Hetzonic Dalit, and if you erase the Dalit, it should be just a, a, a word or two before Hetzonic Dalit. What does Hetzonic mean? Sparing. Sparing. What is it to be kind? It's to show sparing pity, right? Isn't that the way he shows his kind to us? He spares us from what our enemies are doing, but he also spares us from what he would have done to us because of what we deserve. What else does it mean? What about the word lettuce? Um, you see that? Yeah, I see it. Lettuce. L-E-T-T-U-C-E, -E, right? Yeah. Like the vegetable. Ketsomic hay. Ketsomic with the letter hay. The letter hay is a feminine suffix, so it doesn't take away from the verb root, which is hetsomic. Which is the same as to seek refuge. To seek refuge. Have you guys ever sought refuge in a head of lettuce? No. <laughs> now, if you, if you had some sort of cancer, and I've heard that if you squeeze down and you drink spinach and you drink wheatgrass and, and broccoli, I mean, you can find refuge in green vegetables in a certain condition. Who's going to find refuge in a head of lettuce? Who's going to do that? Well, it's, it's, I'm not actual lettuce, but I mean, you know, it grows and just, you know, there's layer after layer. So to me, if, and I do this often when I get like frustrated about a situation, I'll go to the scriptures because I know that the layers in there. I'm going to find what I'm looking for. Okay, so we're, we're, I'm going to write the word layers, layers of cover. Okay, let me ask you another question again. Who's going to find a refuge in a head of lettuce? 
What? You said something, Steve? A rabbit. A rabbit? No, he eats the lettuce. Who finds refuge in the lettuce? A worm. A worm or a bug. So the, here, I'm trying to show you how to read into the pictures of, of the Hebrew. A, as the same way that a bug <coughs> might find refuge in a piece of lettuce, he's finding refuge in the layer upon layer of Yahweh's words. What is layer upon layer of Yahweh's words have to do? Now we're going to look at the word simply psalmic dalit. And what it says here, page 435, stocks for torturing. <laughs> stocks for torturing? What the? Has anybody tried to study Hebrew? Do you feel like you've been put into the stocks for torturing? Yes. No. <laughs> How are the stocks of torturing made? When I was a kid, we went back to Plymouth Rock, and they had stocks, and the little kids could go, it's, it's kind of shaped like this. You got two poles, and you got this other one set up here, two posts, and they've got a big hole and two little holes in a piece of wood. And this thing was in half, huh? Anyway. When somebody was being a screwball and, and causing trouble, they'd, they'd take this guy and they'd stick his head and arms in there and lock him into these blocks of wood. Gosh, your back is hurting like crazy, and you got to stand there for how many hours? And the people could come by and laugh and throw tomatoes at you, and you can't move. Get, get, ah, spitting in your face, and it's like... What does that got to do with anything? That's Saw McDowell. It's also where you get the word Sodom, Saw McDowell at Bob Noon. A wicked, wicked sinners. What's that got to do with stocks for torture? If I keep looking, let me see if there's Saw McDowell at Bob Dallet. Nope, Saw McDowell at Yod Dallet. Nope, Saw McDowell at Hay. Uh, nope, Saw McDowell at Noon. Block, anvil, tree trunk, or axle. Saw McDowell Resh. If I take Saw McDowell and put Resh, that's the word Seder. You know what a Seder is? Everybody know what a Seder? What? The meal you have. It's the order of the meal for Pesach. Everything arranged in a certain order. It means here, Seder, to put in order or to arrange. And it says a bunch of other things. A battle line, a row, set up tight, set up printing like in a printing press, settled down, regulated, order arrangement, typesetter. It's also said raw with the other, hey, the weekly portion of the reading of the penitent. It's the parasha readings. The layers of cover of reading scripture, let's stick a vav. Remember how we say we can stick vavs in the nodes? Let's stick a vav in between Samic and Dalit. Shouldn't change the word at all. So I have to know the alphabetic sequence. <coughs> so I'm looking at Samic, Vav, Dalit. That would be on page 437, I think. And it means to consult in whispers plastered over or whitewashed. Council, secret council, or assembly. Psalmic Dalit, Bob Dalit Yod, Sodi, means secret or privacy. Secret. You ever heard of the four levels of reading scripture that line up with PRDS, which is where we get the word paradise or pardes? Peshat, surface level. Ramez, where they're talking about the allegorical drosh D is where you're consulting mid droshing is the place of droshing where we're bouncing stuff back and trying to figure out what this is. And then you've got the S, the sowed, secret. This is only when we're consulting in whispers, and as Brad Scott calls it, family secrets. You can't know these things. You can't talk about these things. They're covered over layer upon layer. Layers of cover. 
How does the bug find refuge in lettuce? Layer up for layer of cover. That you got a blue heron coming in trying to find somebody to eat. He can't find it because he's layer upon layer of colors. How do we grab a hold of the mauzi of Yahweh? By digging into the layer upon layer of the covers, layers of his secrets. And remember, it has to do with words. It has to do with the engineered structure. Why is this so amygdalic? Because the way the human body has been designed, here's something for the head and the hands. Why was Sodom called that compared to Somic Dalit? Because they take those guys, take the engineered structure of the human body, and do something other than what Yahweh had commanded with it. Based on the design of the human body, you get Sodom me. Sodom, Somic Dalit mem. Once you start looking at this engineered structure of the words, you'll see why everything is called what it's called.